Do you think having access to space is truly serving humanity? I think in terms of developing that technology and even having access to resources that exist on lunar surface, on other sort of celestial bodies, is going to be beneficial for humanity. Hi, my name is Sushil Karam. I am the VP of Strategy with a company called Think Orbital, and I do a bunch of consulting work with, uh, especially in the tourism space as well. Why do we need to go to space? We don't necessarily have to have this thinking of, you know, people traveling just to sort of have a trip and have fun, but more about the science of it, more about the technology development, which also allows us to then develop technology that can further benefit things on Earth. So you can actually use that for further advancements of what you're doing on Earth. To become something like an astronaut, that's such a hard thing to do. It's so hard to sort of access that but even astronauts can't really go on Mars today in terms of how much access and how much limitation you have. I mean, for that matter, going on, on the moon, it's not something that they can do today. Before we get to this episode, Amin and I had two massive favors to ask. We started this podcast on our passion to connect with interesting people with fascinating stories and sharing those stories with everyone so we can all learn from them. Now, what's truly fueling our growth and to help us share more stories, some very interesting people. One is our passion of storytelling and really wanting to hear people's stories because we generally believe in the power of sharing real human stories. But also your word of mouth and sharing with your family and friends is just as powerful to help us have more reach to people out there. So please do share it with anyone who you think might benefit from it. Currently, only a third of you that are listening to us are, have followed us on any whatever platform that you are uh, accessing to our podcast. So we would love to see more of you joining that cohort. So please follow us on whatever platform you're hearing this message on. For now, let's get into the episode. Sushil, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Let's get into it. Sushil, you're a vice president of strategy in a, I suppose, up and coming space company called Think Orbital. Um, you're also highly specialized in marketing or what we we're talking about earlier being the strategic tourism marketing, you're a father and you're a husband. So you've got a, quite a few titles. What I'm really interested in is removing all these titles a minute, knowing who is Sushil Kara. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think, uh, I think as a person, uh, generally I would say, uh, I'm someone who's probably very, at the center of it, very curious in nature, generally. Uh, and it's it's kind of been a strange thing because from looking at, you know, I see, I see a lot of that in my in my son when I reflect back and kind of see this sense of uh, awkward alien sense of like, you know, because what, what the curious, curiosity does, it, it leads to a sense of observation and you're always observing and really looking at what people are doing, how they're acting, how they're behaving. And you tend to sort of get this sense of an outside outsider view it is, is how it always feels because you don't see that stuff coming just naturally as a reaction. Uh, and I, I, I see that a lot in my son when I compare it and I feel I, I kind of feel happy about that because then you, you kind of feel like, okay, this is this is how I was. And at least I know there's someone else on this world who kind of has a similar sense of it. And you can kind of nudge him and tell him, hey, I know what's going on because I went through it and I kind of had a reflection on it. Uh, I don't think when, you know, when I was growing up, my parents had much of that time to even look at that stuff because they were so busy and there was a very different generation. Uh, but I think, yeah, that, that, that curiosity leads to this sense of observation. I, I really like to sort of look at, and I think we all do it, but we don't really, uh, we don't really notice ourselves doing it. Uh, we are really observing, we're really learning from like how people are talking, how they're interacting, how they're behaving, reacting. Uh, you know, a lot of people that we think are mentors, you know, former bosses, whatever, we actually pull in a lot of what their personalities were, what their behaviors were, and we actually adapt to that. And it becomes like these small little bubbles that eventually makes our giant personality. Uh, and I think that tends to happen just by observing sort of different people, different behaviors. Uh, I kind of really like sometimes I look at these old interviews from the 70s uh, that'll usually just pop up out of the blue on like YouTube. You're you're actually doing trying to do some real work and a YouTube video comes up of like a Marlon Brando interview from the 70s or something. And you go, yeah, that's interesting. Let me just watch what that is. And you'll get onto that and you'll see a lot of these interviews. Like you, you look at Marlon Brando, you look at Muhammad Ali who are like really good talkers. But if you look at their interviews from like that 70s phase, it's such a different style and uh, way of communicating 
to then 80s to the 90s. And I think what happens is because as a, as a species, we've evolved how to communicate by looking at each other and learning the best practice and keep building on it. So I feel that sense of observation, curiosity always is in everyone, but we don't necessarily identify it as, you know, a level of strength or, you know, where that sits. But I think at the center of that, that's probably where I am. Like I, I always see that's a key part of, uh, you know, my personality and how I see things, how I see the world and move forward. I love that. And I really want to get back into the communication side of it, but we'll get to that a bit later. What I want to know first is how old is your son? Oh, he's seven. He's going to turn eight this year. Right. Yeah. So when you were seven, would you say you were as curious and observant? I, I think uh, I have, uh, like my family usually tells me, I have very vivid memories of certain incid incidents that, you know, when I'll usually, usually reflect back, my mom is going to be like, oh, you know, that's, that's pretty solid. Like you remember that level of detail of it. Like even I don't remember, but you're right. That did happen. And that's exactly how it happened. So I think there must have been some sort of images or moments that you captured. And some of them are really odd and awkward. Like they're random. They, they don't make any sense. Like why you remember that. Uh, and some of them are very critical to kind of your development or what you saw the world as. Uh, so yeah, and I find that, I find a similar thing when my son sort of reflects back on, you know, trips that we have taken when he's three years old, for, for instance, and he'll kind of reflect back on something that he remembers very vividly of a particular street and a particular city we visited. Uh, so I think that's that's another sort of key context. And look, I think as parents, you know, between husband and wife, you're always kind of comparing and saying like, no, it, he's got more of me or more of more of her, you know, that you're kind of always battling that out. Uh, but but I think from my sense, I see a lot of that, that, you know, sort of the curiosity, the observ observation, that sort of time stamping in your in your head of different uh, things that have happened. And uh, I do I do think what helps him a little bit probably is also that in this generation, you have videos and photos of almost every little moment. So they have an easier reference point. And sometimes you don't know whether they're actually remembering stuff the way you remember or because they actually have images that they can put together. Uh, but yeah, I think a lot of times I do notice that there are things that he'll bring out of the blue and, you know, he'll he'll, he'll surprise you. And he'll be like, I'm like, I, I wouldn't have remembered that. Actually, you remembered that more than I did. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aging like my parents were now and he's kind of the younger one who's absorbing <laughs> the information and uh, taking things in, I guess, so. I like to see uh, life as a series of dominoes yep. that fall yep. and, and you eventually end up somewhere in this universe. What is the earliest domino that you remember falling that kind of resulted in where you are today? Uh, I, I usually like to connect like, cause obviously, uh, you know, when we, when we started Think Orbital, uh, one of the things we were talking about uh, with the founders when I was working with, I was kind of telling them uh, it, it'll help because we need to always think about like our earliest stories. And I remember uh, when our team was just sort of getting built and uh, coming together, uh, it was very hard because it, it was a completely remote setup at that point in time. It was just during COVID essentially. So everyone was like stuck in their homes pretty much anywhere else in the world. There was, uh, at that time we had uh, myself and another uh, gentleman in Sydney. So we had two people in Australia. We had a couple of people spread across Europe, uh, one person in Taiwan, I think. So we had we had like people spread across the world, different time zones, and we would all kind of come together once a week uh, with our updates, uh, you know, at a, at a time zone that was late night for someone, early morning for someone, midday for someone. And uh, it was always hard to kind of connect and pull people together. Uh, and one of the ways that I found to get that engagement from people and make them feel part of that community was allow them to reflect back on a few things that linked to space. So space was our cent sort of center where we were going to focus on, but like linking back to your personal connection to space. So either a past story, in some cases I told them, hey, you know, in, in, a, in a particular language, how do, you, how do you say the word space? So in your language, how do you say it? So everyone kind of got super excited, kind of came up with words on that. Uh, but I think, I think if you talk about like dominoes and how things fall, probably the earliest memory linked to space, because that's probably where I'm focusing on today. Probably the, the major chunk of my work goes in there is, uh, I have this I have this random memory of uh, probably being about four-ish years old. And uh, I mean, I means lived in, you know, the GCC. So you kind of know how the mall environment used to be back then, back Absolutely. in the eighties and stuff. So we go to a mall and uh, uh, buy, uh, 
uh, sort of helium foil balloons and uh, my sister gets one, I get one. And uh, uh, some point in time, I think she, I lose mine and then she donates hers because she's the nice little older sibling. And uh, while walking to the next place that we're supposed to go to, uh, I'm obviously tired and one of my uncles is carrying me and I fall asleep. And I, I clearly remember sort of losing the balloon off my hand and waking up and going, oh crap, I lost this one as well. And uh, I, I remember sort of seeing that balloon sort of float away. And as a kid, you probably don't have great depth of perception. So you start seeing this balloon and in the sky, you start seeing stars and you, you start feeling like, oh, that's the balloon and it's moving. So at some point in time, the balloon disappeared and you started observing a star. And I assume that that's still my balloon and it's become a star. So as a, as a child, you kind of have this random memory of like, you know, you saw this helium balloon fly up and you felt like that's become a star. And maybe that's what happens to balloons. And that's how stars are there. They're just kids who lost their balloons, right? Uh, so I think that's that's probably the earliest sort of space related memory that I can remember, which was sort of a tragedy, but got me quite curious in the sector generally. Uh, and then eventually, you know, I, I, you know, life kind of just takes its toe, like own path and you kind of work on different things. Uh, space wasn't necessarily an area of focus, but I think it's an area that everyone gets very excited about. Anyone I, sp I speak to about any idea on space, like it's just they'll, they'll sit up and they'll listen and they get very excited about it. Uh, so it, it is a very unique uh, sector. I think it brings a lot of people together from an emotional connection as well, not just from an intellectual mindset. Uh, and if you tap into that, you can really pull out so many ideas and so many uh, places of development for for practical applications as well, if you really wanted to work on things. Uh, so kind of being able to transition into that and take some of my experience into that area has been a lot of fun, you know, a lot, lot of, uh, it's opened your sort of eyes in terms of what you can do, how you can contribute and uh, really allowed you to build that further as well. So yeah. that's been great. I yes. think that's kind of, if I take a series of dominoes to where I am today, but I'm pretty sure the dominoes are still sort of falling and <laughs> it'll land into something completely different somewhere. <laughs> and Yes. Um, space. You said a, a lot of people have emotional connection to space. I don't have any. Oh, really? No. Okay. So tell me some some of the emotional connections that you've had so far. Because I've thought about it. The moment you said, it, I'm like, what is my emotional connection to space? And I couldn't. Not, nothing came to me. That's really interesting. Yeah. So what are the stories you've heard? I mean, I think most people. Uh, it's it's usually do with childhood, right? So a lot of people yeah. uh, find. Uh, space from that childhood perspective, extremely fascinating because you have memories usually about sort of staring up in the stars, you know, wondering what's happening. It's it's a world that you can see, but you can't ever access, right? So you can, you can think about anything on a tourism perspective that you might have seen a picture of Paris, you know, you, you see the Eiffel Tower, you see anything else and you feel like, oh, you know, someday, and you know it's approachable. You can actually reach it very reasonably. All you need is a little bit of money, right? Where space isn't just that, it's not just about money. It's It's got so many other challenges of how do you survive, how do you cope in that environment? Uh, you know, how do you even get up there, first of all? Uh, and then once you're up there, how do you survive to get to as far as a planet like Mars or anything else, right? So I think there's so many other challenges in space that it just doesn't become accessible. And you keep growing into that sort of environment where you feel like almost everything else I saw, I could reach. If I, if I see, uh, sharks, if I see, you know, something underwater, I can go scuba diving. It's accept accessible, right? I can go and do it today. Uh, it's not going to, you go through certain training and you can do it. But to become something like an astronaut, that's such a hard thing to do. It's so hard to sort of access that. But even astronauts can't really go on Mars today. So in terms of how much access and how much limitation you have, I mean, for that matter, going on on the moon, it's not something that they can do today. They need to rebuild the infrastructure to get to be able to do that again, right? So, so it tells you a lot about, I think, access as well. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that's probably where that attraction or obsession comes about because it feels like it's, it's even harder to get than the other stuff that we've seen. But at the same time, you've seen it. It's so obvious. It's out there every single night, every single day. It's right there. It's staring at you in your face, right? The moon's yeah. there. You can see planets. You can see news coming up of like, you know, couple of planets are aligning and people are going to line up to sort of see it or there's a meteor shower and people are going to line up to see it. Yeah. Uh, I think it brings people together because they feel it's a global thing. It's not just uh, my country, my city, my religion, my basis thing. Uh, whereas everything else seems like curated by boundaries. I wish I wish I thought of that when I was younger. Yeah. Uh, 
we touched on my story a little bit. I grew up in a country where I was limited doing a lot of things. So yep. we couldn't even travel between states. I couldn't study certain subjects. And that was a trigger for me to come here, right? So if I was looking, so I think it, a, lot, a lot of it is really context related for that particular person to have the emotional connection with this space. Because if I was me, the only dream I would have at the time was like, how the heck do I get out of this country to go and create something out of myself, right? Yeah, so. That's and so again, interesting. Because my childhood had a lot of travel in it because we're five kids in a house, three girls and, and two boys, and I'm the youngest of five. And so they were always finishing their studies and traveling. And the reason I got to aerospace engineering was aircrafts because I jumped on this aircraft as young as three-year-old, even two-year-old. I'm staring at these planes and I go, wow, yeah. you jump on this thing. Yeah. And two hours, three hours later, you're seeing your siblings again. And I was fascinated, wait a minute, I'm traveling in time? Why am I traveling in space? Or how is this working? Like, why does this, like, and this was almost like the yeah. space equivalent. Yeah. Um, there was some curiosity around space, but I think your childhood and the environment you grew up in, it definitely bounds your imagination. Mm. Hey, did you, did you ever, when you, were, when you were a kid, did you ever sort of see planes fly by and you kind of wave at them? Did you ever do that? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah? Did you ever do that? I actually wrote, wrote, wrote it this morning. I used to I used, I used to work in this aluminium factory two late hours of the night, like yeah. two, three in the morning, and used to see planes flying. And that's about the same time that I start dreaming about coming to Australia. Yeah. So I was looking at them like, yeah, one day I'm going to be one of those and go to Australia. Yeah. Yeah, but I, 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 I mean, never waved at one. I so that's that's <laughs> a strange thing because I I remember like I think I don't know whether it's an our generation thing or like probably based on that GCC kind of area where we grew up. But I remember it's GCC. Sort of, uh, uh, the Gulf Corporation, yeah, okay. so like yeah, the, yeah. the UAE, Qatar, and all those yeah, guys, yeah, yeah. Bahrain, Saudi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, I, I sort of remember there was this whole phase where all of us kids, we would just used to look at planes and keep waving at them, right? And and I, I, I don't see my son doing that, for instance. Like, I don't see a generation today doing it. There's no excitement. And I think because travel, air travel was still that sort of just newish kind of thing like you could you could do it but it wasn't really something you do frequently and kids now kind of have much more broader access you do a lot more interstate as well like you know you'd, you'd go to gold coast or wherever you want to go so it's different uh but i think yeah it's it's pretty interesting when you're saying but i'm, I'm quite curious I, like even even looking at uh you know where you were based looking at the stars seeing a shooting star at some point in time never sort of sparked anything kind of as just curiosity like that's pretty quick that's pretty cool or do you have any memory of I, stuff like that? The only, when I think about space and looking at the stars in the sky late at night, the only thing I can I, I can feel and remember is the sense the sense of calmness and peace that yep. it gave me. That that's that's where it ends. Yep. I'm not gonna sit here and say yes, I am passionate about space. I have a question, ethical question. Why do we need to go to space? I think uh, it's it's one of those things that you know from mm -hmm. an access point of view, it's. Uh, and I don't think it from a purely sort of tourism perspective, right? Like I think uh, initially when I got into it, I saw, in fact, some the reason I got into it was when I was working at uh, the uh, with the government in Dubai, uh, the economy and tourism department, uh, there was some work that I'd initially done on this thinking around how the space tourism, especially the suborbital tourism market evolves and uh, trying to expand that definition in a way that space tourism shouldn't just be about the person going from you know point A on Earth to point B in suborbit and kind of coming back down, it should be more about the fact that the person who's coming in, he's coming into a particular city and he's going to get some sort of training, he's going to get acclimatized, go through a process of kind of procedures, signing documents, whatever. So there's a wider impact of what happens in that economy. It's not just about this one launch company that launches and gets it back. Uh, and along with that, obviously, the person travels with family, with friends. Uh, sometimes <clears throat> you also see with launches where people want to actually travel to see a launch because taking a picture of a rocket going in space is pretty exciting. So there's a bunch of factors around, you know, from a space tourism perspective that can impact an economy. Uh, and that was the thinking that then got me quite interested in seeing, you know, what could happen in, in the space sector. Uh, Adelaide was exciting only because obviously had the Australian uh, Space Agency that had just started uh, fairly early back then before I moved here. And uh, I was kind of looking at, okay, what could be the opportunities here? Brought some of that similar thinking to talk to even, you know, the tourism commission over here, but didn't really move too much. Uh, 
And eventually I think Think Orbital happened and that that's the direction I went. But I think initially Think Orbital's focus was space tourism. We were thinking about space tourism. Uh, and then eventually we kind of said, you know what, that's not the market we want to go after because I think space doesn't necessarily have to have the initial focus, or at least that's my perspective and definitely most of the team members. We don't necessarily have to have this thinking of, you know, people traveling just to sort of have a trip and have fun, but more about the science of it, more about the technology development, which also allows us to then develop technology that can further benefit things on Earth. So you can actually use mm -hmm. that for further advancements of what you're doing on Earth. Uh, in some ways, space also becomes, I think, this, uh, going back to that previous point that we were saying of, you know, how it might have a slight more emotional connection with people. Uh, and I can give you a typical example of, you know, we, are, we, we recently reached out to uh, uh, a company for a partnership opportunity and uh, uh, asked them, look, would you provide something to us for a minimal cost? And they, they kind of agreed to it pretty quickly because the fact that it's associated to a space project is extremely exciting. So I think space in itself has this brand, which no one sort of owns, but it's got an image, it's got an idea behind it. People kind of love kind of being associated with it in some ways because it gives them this access to a sort of a club, if you want to call it, that makes it feel like, okay, I'm, I'm involved in something that's a little more humanity linked rather than just my national interest, my uh, you know city or country or local interest. Uh, and I think that's another part of space that's that should be leveraged, uh, that should be utilized where countries kind of collaborate together, work together. Obviously, you also have the military element of it, which is the the space wars that are technically happening right now, and you have countries kind of competing in that space and that domain. And again, even that's very relevant because it pushes countries to deliver more technology, get to a place faster, push the industry, push the sectors to get there. Uh, and I think a lot of that eventually benefits stuff back on Earth, not just mm. purely from how do you travel to space, what do you do? But if we kind of sit down and think about, you know, do we need to go to space? We'd just be like, don't need to do it and uh, don't need to even research, don't need to build anything on it. And I think what will happen as a result of that, and I feel Australia kind of is, in my opinion, struggling a little bit with that. Uh, I was reading something earlier today about, you know, where, the, where their budgets cuts on uh, a lot of our satellite technologies that was really building up for Earth observation that's gonna support us with marine, uh, with uh, natural disasters, monitoring uh, agriculture. And the focus is very much around the idea of, you know, we wanna look at what's our immediate export market and how can we develop technology that can be exported and we can make money back as a country. But the truth is agriculture is a huge export market. Uh, the marine ecosystem that you have is a massive tourism pull you know, if we can't monitor that by our own national data security perspective, we're essentially mm. relying on foreign technologies to do that for us, you know, relying on partners globally. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we really need to think about how do we grow that and scale that, I think, locally from our own cap capacity and build that <clears throat> further yeah. because it links to so many other industries and so many other sectors. And yeah. we don't normally think about that. Yeah. Quick one. Can you please take a second and follow us on whatever platform you're listening to us from? I couldn't agree more. I think... You touched on a great point. Historically, and this is where I suppose start coming out now. You talk mm -hmm. about the Cold War in space. Yep. Right? And we might think, yeah, that was a very, I guess, bad series of events. But it's only as a result of that Cold War that we had a series of technology development yep. that we have access to today. And that's actually basically democratized to the average user. We forget that most technology actually ends up coming up from military use cases to the point where they become cheap and commercial enough to sell it to a consumer, right? And this is almost why you said like the domino within space yep. or war or military, it's the ripple effect. I mean, I think we've learned we don't have to go to war to compete on tech development to learn how to bring more technology to humans. Um, but I think going back to Ali's question, which I think you've answered, but I want like a short rapid fire. Do you think having access to space is truly serving humanity? I think so. I mean, I think uh, I think in terms of developing that technology and even having access to resources that exist uh, on lunar surface, on other sort of celestial bodies, uh, is going to be beneficial for humanity. Uh, one, one thing that humanity lacks, in my opinion, is that we we always feel that based on the comfort that we have today, based on the life that we have today, we end up 
perceiving future in a particular context that we have today, but we have very little context of our past. And that's because you're you're really living about, you're at about 40, 50, 60 years of age of when you're deciding that. You know, and if you listen to someone like, I know a very contra- controversial figure, but if you listen to someone like Henry Kissinger who turned like 100 years now, uh, and if you hear his sort of context of when he's talking about the geopolitical stuff from the 60s and 70s and 80s, which he's lived through, right? It's a very different perspective. So I think I think it's it's very relevant to kind of if if we could live for like two hundred years, we could probably have a better context of comparing and saying that this this could be relevant, this could not be relevant. But because we are in our forties or thirties or whatever, you know, you guys are probably in your thirties. You know, you you look your you like your twenties. So thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, getting compliments today. <laughs> but I think uh, I think what what tends to happen is we don't get <clears throat> enough depth of that context. In, in humanity and you, you can go back and study in the past and kind of get reference points but I mean you and I probably I mean probably have this context when we look at the GCC market like in Saudi and the UAE and even looking back to about a hundred years if you look at the map of that region and how that developed is so significantly different to what it is today and the typical sort of mindset that a media would perceive for that particular region of like you know these are the problems of that region without having the relevant context of what happened 60 years ago in that region is not really fair. Mm. So I think I think that's very important where you kind of look at the past, see where we were, the more in depth you get into that and the more uh, mixed perspectives you get, because there, there are perspectives that are gonna be negative, there's perspectives that are gonna be positive as well, right? So getting the wider perspective is gonna help you in some ways understand, okay, how would this impact the future? And then you have probably a slightly better sense of the future. You still can't predict it, but you probably have a slightly better gauge of like, the future should be flexible. I can't say it's gonna be X or Y and I shouldn't put all my eggs in one basket. I should put them, spread them around for a reason because things could change based on how that's changed in the past. And that wouldn't have been predictable, right? So. Space is a great topic to keep talking about, but I wanna go back a little bit. What happened after that instance that you lost your balloon twice? What? Is the timeline of your story into where you are today? Take us through that. Uh, I mean, I don't think I don't <laughs> think the blo- the balloon kind of uh, became a recurring theme in my life. <laughs> I did uh, it. All right. <laughs> but I mean, but life life kind of goes on. You kind of do different things, right? So uh, I think uh, uh, I remember going through phases of like wanting to grow up. Uh, uh, a bit embarrassing to kind of admit today, but when you're younger, do, do you, did you guys ever listen to uh, New Kids on the Block? No. Uh, probably before your time. There was this, <laughs> it, was this, it was this terrible boy band, you know, and it was really cool back then. And uh, it, it kind of, the music used to be really catchy and he used to be like, oh, I want to be a rock star. And my son says that a lot. He said, I want to be a rock star when I grow up. And I'm like, oh, I went through that phase. <laughs> we'll move on to the next one move on, very son. soon. So, uh, and uh, so I wanted to be a rock star. I remember then going through a phase where uh, I started picking up basketball and uh, I even look at like even, you know, how different context is back then to now, because back then, if you wanted to keep playing basketball, the only thing you could see was the NBA. Whereas today, if you think about it, you have so many other leagues globally that you can actually target and kind of build your career towards. Uh, and I remember being this short Indian sort of stocky kid, uh, you know, in, in studying in Dubai, uh, in somewhere about seventh grade or something. And uh, I remember a headmaster once coming in to the class and uh, getting really upset with all the students because everyone was talking over our voices. The teacher wasn't in class and kind of going like, guys, you're an embarrassment to yourself. And uh, he says, uh, you know, trust me, all your parents, they're working so hard to get you guys into school and doing all this, trying to give you the values of it. And says, I'm assuming all of you want to grow up and be engineers, doctors, pilots. Is there someone who wants to be something else? And I kind of, put my hand up and he goes like, <laughs> he goes, this smart, smart ass kid, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm like, uh, I'm like, I actually want to be a basketball player. I want to play for the NBA. And the whole class bursts out laughing because they're like, hey, what's wrong with you? You can't, you can't do that. And uh, God. so I, I went through that phase uh, till I think eventually uh, I did make the school team. So it wasn't, it wasn't too bad, but realizing, <laughs> realizing that, you know, getting into the NBA, maybe, maybe my chances are slim. So maybe I should focus on something else. Uh, and then I think going into university, uh, got, uh, got interested in marketing. I got very interested in marketing and business management generally. I, I, I quite liked that side of uh, the world. 
And uh, initially it started with this obsession of advertising, like really looking at the advertising market and how that operates. Uh, I had a, I remember having a neighbor who uh, used to work with uh, this company called Promo7. Uh, it, was an, it was an agency uh, but run by a Lebanese guy actually uh, uh, in, in the UAE. And they used to do a lot of campaigns for like the big brands like Pepsi and uh, that's other stuff as well. And I used to find all that stuff so cool and fascinating that you get to work with these big brands and build stuff. Uh, so I, I, I got very obsessed in that side of studying and learning and then uh, did my undergrad in that. And uh, eventually when it got to doing my master's, I, I felt like I want to be really specialized and get into the sports uh, arena. So kind of wanted to get into sport management. So I did my master's in sport management up at Griffith uh, over here. And uh, yeah, from there it was just kind of strange because I think, I think there are a lot of things that... Uh, and what we were talking about earlier, uh, Ali, was like, you know, the macro side of things. Because when you focus on the micro, you feel like you're you're doing these random things and you're like, but this is not adding to the stuff I was doing previously. Like, this is such a departure from what I was doing previously. So I remember going through a phase where I got into filmmaking and got into video editing and all that stuff as well. Got, got quite excited about that stuff. Uh, worked with a couple of sort of producers locally, kind of got around that sector and that side. And then felt like, nope, this is not going to be it either. So moved on to something else. So I think I I jumped between things quite quite often. Eventually got a chance to work uh, on the sports side with uh, some of the sort of Olympic Council of Asia and the International Olympic Committee kind of events. So that became like a big doorway where I got to travel a bit. Then did my PhD while I was doing that. Uh, so yeah, I think that that was kind of the initial where I felt was a little more anchored. Before that was all kind of like you were just jumping from things to things. I did a bit of journalism, like there was just random stuff that you were trying out to really get a test, like a taste of things. Uh, and uh, and yeah, then sports became that that cent central thing. I did some consulting work for the Qatar Olympic Committee. This was back in 2011, did that for about a year. And uh, right around then I got married. So my wife kind of said, I want to be settled in a particular city, you know, not keep jumping like you do between different areas. And uh, then it became like Dubai was the city that we ba went back to because my parents were there, her family was there. Uh, and then that transitioned eventually to working with the media. So worked a little bit with the with the media over there, more from sort of events and marketing perspective again. Uh, and then eventually got back into government, worked with the economy and tourism department for a few years. Uh, and then our son was born and we said, you know, let's, let's look at Australia because there was always this you know, revisiting with Australia. So I said, let's go back and let's have a look at how things work here. And uh, that became that became the kind of move, came to Australia, COVID hit. COVID was like another big surprise that we, so I think again, going back to that point of like, you know, how do you predict things? No one could have predicted COVID, right? Like, so, mm -hmm. so it's just so hard to kind of really uh, structure or, or strategize your whole life based on, I know exactly how I'm planning this and this is gonna happen things change so dramatically and significantly that you just need to be that nimble person that can move around and say, okay, I'll move and I'll move to the next thing. Uh, and I think that's that's part of life. And that's mm -hmm. why that macro perspective is so important that you look at the overall picture and see, you know what, you've been fortunate that you got to experience so many things in so many different contexts, build so many different relationships, uh, rather than thinking about, you know, the micro sort of failures and wins because that stuff is just, you know, it comes and goes. Mm -hmm. So. Is there something yet that you would have, if you if you had the chance to go back in time, that would you would do differently? Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, I think uh, again it it goes back to that thought, right? Like when you look at the bigger picture, when you have the eagle eye, you feel like if I if something would have changed here, it wouldn't have got you here, and I think that's such a, a humbling experience. You know, you see a lot of times where we sometimes blame a family member, like a parent or someone that you didn't do X, therefore I don't have Y. Uh, and that tends to happen a lot as you keep growing through life and you have moments of failure, you feel like, oh, if they would have just done that one little thing right, this would have been perfect. Uh, but I think when you kind of look at the overall context of where they were, uh, what they brought to the table and how, how much they, that little, like my father, for instance, uh, migrated from India uh, to Dubai and I was, I was about two months old when we moved to Dubai. Uh, that move's done not, not out of this interest of wanting to go to Dubai. That move from him is just purely because he came from a sort of mom and pop shop business kind of family. And uh, he couldn't get along with his father in terms of business ideas. Like they had a, 
a battle of sort of the times essentially where you know you have a different generation coming with different ideas and he said you know what i'm going to just figure stuff on my own and he leaves and goes first to mumbai works there for a bit and then feels like dubai is an opportunity moves to dubai and then eventually moves the family there and i feel like even those little steps that he took uh if he hadn't done that life would be so different because you would be growing up in dubai in, in india in a different condition your mindset would be different your way of thinking your way of looking at things would be different and uh growing up in the in the middle east and especially in a place like the uae at that point in time in the 80s and 90s where i feel like you have this perfect blend and i'm sure everyone tends to feel like something about their childhood was perfect ish because it was a golden era but you have this perfect blend of like a place that doesn't have all the fast food chains that the US has but they're gradually creeping in you know they're coming in slowly so you're getting you're getting initial sort of just you're moving with the market you know you're not you're not someone who came in and the market's there uh, and it's a very different feeling like you feel like you're growing with the community and you're invo- evolving with that community and then as you grow older obviously you still have a sense of which i'm sure i mean must have had similar that you start realizing hold on so this is home but it's not home you know you're not you're still an expat you're not you do you know you don't you don't become a citizen or you don't become a permanent resident in any ways uh and then kind of having probably some sense of uh uh not not a very positive sense with with that environment kind of feeling like well, where where do i sit here am i am i not part of it am i a part of it because everything's here but it's not here i agree I and mean, just want to pause you there because that idea behind in li- like living in different places i think both ali and i struggle with it and you clearly have a global mindset you've traveled around the world you've worked across multiple roles government private sector i have this burning question who is your community today i think your community becomes uh it evolves uh and uh are, are you married no. no i think i think when you get married and if you have that partner uh, that becomes your immediate community at least for me it is uh and then obviously your family your parents and stuff that becomes a big part of it as well so that that becomes your core and i think everything else you kind of feel like can rotate and shift and then some of it is still anchored and they might be anchored in completely different countries so i have a friend in canada for instance i have a friend in dubai so some of these guys are the first people i'll call when i have an idea like if this idea comes out i'm like let me text him and see what he says and usually there'll be the guys who'll either say like that's an amazing idea or they'll say like it's terrible trust me don't waste your time on it right and i think those are the first people that you go to and they become your anchor sort of tenants in your life uh and you almost feel like nothing can go wrong with them like they can they can they can't really upset you you can't really upset them you have that comfort with them uh and because of the way the uae or the region was people migrated out so that's why i say one's in canada one's still in dubai i'm in australia so you kind of spread across but you're still connected because you had a central history in, in the UAE you made you made you made a time uh, a tie up in in Dubai that you had uh and uh, i think that's kind of where it comes from i i can't always i feel like when i compare people in adelaide for instance when i talk to a lot of families i feel many of them didn't really venture out and for them they have a much more closer connection locally and they're kind of settled here uh but i also sometimes feel like that's not that's not me like i can't i think it's just because it's not been something that you grew up into it doesn't feel like you can really adapt to that you want to have a rotating environment where you want different people coming in uh someone pats your back someone slaps your face but you get a different experience out of everyone differently and it all all goes back in your reserve bank and you kind of have a context of a wider environment uh and then you kind of have a bigger picture of life right like because otherwise you ha- if you just have the same 20 30 people 50 people or however big your community is there's somewhere where you probably aren't getting the wider international experiences which i'm sure you guys do because you've traveled you've come through you've gone through a lot more in life but even if you share that with someone over here it's so hard for them to really put it into context because they haven't lived through that level of detail that you have or i have and i think like I'm not sure what you think Ali I'm actually keen to get your thoughts it's their definition of a relationship you've got the people who've left their home or their let's call it original community or where they were when they were kids and then where they travel to and i think fundamentally the way you perceive relationships friendships family just changes i agree with you it does 
I look at our friendship today. Yeah. I think for me, I've, I've been reflecting on this a little bit lately because of that constant, constantly changing the environment all yeah. the time. Um, I personally find it hard to build really good, deeper relationships now because I'm just used to change a lot, right? I just want to be like, okay, what's the next? Like, I have my very close circles, but outside of that, I'm struggling but to do it. It took us five years. Yeah, it took us so long. It took time. us three years and a bit. Actually. Yeah. So the last two years, we were very close, but I've yeah. been only for five years. Mm. So, yeah. If you were to sum up your experiences in three dot points, advises for your seven year old son, how would you do that? Oh, uh, probably, uh, don't worry too much. Like don't, don't sort of evaluate a mistake too much and too long, kind of move on and just let it go. That's probably one. Uh, don't, and pro the second would probably be don't doubt yourself too much, like in terms of talking and kind of reaching out and communicating. I, I have, I, I tend to find like, uh, a lot of my younger experiences where I wasn't really, uh, I wouldn't approach people too often. Uh, and you know, having an older sibling who's a lot more sort of leading figure in your life, I think does that sometimes where you kind of rely and kind of can tag along rather than having to do it yourself. Uh, and I think Australia became a very good part in my life where I got to sort of leave that behind and then had to venture out and fill it, figure it out myself. So don't ever doubt that and kind of just reach out and do it. And my son does it pretty well. Like I think some of the tests I've done with him, uh, which uh, is, is a bit of a is a bit of a uh, bit of a trick. Uh, hopefully, no sort of baristas are listening. But uh, one of the things I do with him is uh, he he always asks me that can I get a marshmallow from a coffee shop? And a lot of times I don't really want the coffee, so I don't want to go in and order a coffee just to give him a free marshmallow, or not want to have to pay like five dollars for his, for two two marshmallow pieces. So I'll tell him, you know what? Here you go. Here's five dollars. Why don't you go and ask the guy inside? And he's like, why should I do it? I'm like, just go and try it. And he'll usually go as like this six or seven year old and go like, excuse me, can I get a marshmallow? And they'll be like, oh, sure. And he's going to wave that $5 bill. And uh, they'll be like, oh, don't worry about it. We don't need the money. Just take the marshmallow and leave. And he goes, like, they didn't take the money. I'm like, that's the trick, you know? <laughs> so don't be afraid. Just keep going and trying it out and uh, you'll, you'll figure it out. Uh, and the third thing, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, three things. What would I tell him? Uh, uh, I guess family is important. Like always keep sight of that. Like, you know, your, your strong connections and family doesn't necessarily have to be just the family you're born into, but you know, people you really build as friends and strong connections with, and you develop that trust with, yeah. uh, they become family in some ways that you can rely on and you can go back to, and you can be upset with them at some random points in time, but you know that they're there and you, you're always going to go back and figure things out. Uh, so keep those keep those anchor tenants uh, in your life who are gonna be there for for looking after you, and you can look after them as well. So, so let go of all the mistakes. Maybe trust yourself and have a go, and take care of your family. Yep. Couldn't agree more with the family part. It's the greatest anchor you can have. I think yeah. I've lost touch and touch with that for a while because you you move away from your family, and you don't realize what it's like, especially when you do it at a young age. But once you reconnect, you realize, okay, that was the missing part yep. in my life. Um, we have an ending tradition okay. in the podcast. I'm not sure if you've listened to any of our episodes. I, our previous guest has left you a question, oh. uh, which I will play. Hopefully loads easily. You got this. We believe in you, Sushil. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> is it a tricky question from the previous previous guest? Uh, I don't think so. I think I may sometimes need to... Sometimes they're actually relatively, I think, easy. And sometimes they're really tricky. Like, you have to think about it. So I, I need you to log into the Wi-Fi. What is the one thing in your life that you have achieved or experienced that you're most proud of? Uh, I think just... Uh, and I'm sure, I, I'm sure it'll change because uh, I think you're your most current self should probably be what you feel is the best version of yourself, like in, in terms of where you are. Uh, and the reason I say it's gonna change is because life's gonna still throw more things at you and you're gonna figure it out and you'll probably come through and feel like that's the best version of it. But I think that achievement of like being in a place that I am today where I can uh, have a sort of oversight of uh, 
the things I've done, you know, kind of gone through different steps and kind of the sense of just this realization of uh, uh, everything that you thought was irrelevant or, you know, distraction or failure wasn't really a failure. Like I remember a moment where I used to sit on the computer and just do random softwares and learn like Photoshop or something. And I, I, I even back then didn't know why I was doing it, but I just enjoy doing it. And my father used to come home and my father of a generation who's not really seen people on computers that much, right? So being in being in high school or early college, just sort of sitting on the computer, he would come home and he would stare at me and go like, oh, he's on the computer again. Like, you know, and my wife would be like, my, my, my mom would be like, you know, just let him, let him do it. Let him figure it out. Like, you know, let him do what he wants to do. Uh, and then reflecting back on that and thinking like, oh, but that was a wasted skill. Like I didn't use it. But the truth is so much of what I do in life today it just helps so much of what I have to do because anyone in the team who can't do something and might not be a designer, I can say, actually, you know what? I can probably do something very quickly on that and help you guys out. So there's these random skills that you picked which you didn't think were relevant, but they eventually somehow support something or the other in your in your life. Uh, just I think the sense of that, the awareness of that is probably an achievement in itself that I feel like getting to that stage where you can appreciate every little thing is a pretty big deal. And uh, that's probably the best thing. Amazing. It's been great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, Ashio. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for listening. I'm sure this episode has really resonated with you, but we'd love to know which part. We would love to get your feedback, so please do reach out to us via our website or any of our social media platforms. You can find these through any of the links attached to this episode.